came to mind this show, Succession. Very similar here, where these two media companies had a lot of power. Along comes uh, Amazon. You know how Amazon is. Yeah, they are very aggressive when it comes to... Adriana Rangel. Host for the Serious Sellers podcast for Helium 10. A seasoned Amazon expert. Unveiling invaluable insights. For the Spanish-speaking world. What is it like selling products in Mexico? We have a lot of similarities. We watch HBO, Netflix, and all of that, right? We have e-commerce. It's a great thing for people that are trying to sell in this market because the amount of hours that the average Mexican works is like one of the highest in the world. Early in my career, I was like, no, there has to be another way, especially as a female. I don't want to make it a gender thing. There's no way to sugarcoat it. I don't need to be playing your guys' games and under your rules, right? I had a full-time job when I started this and I eventually was able to leave it. That is why I'm so excited to... Have you been hearing any rumblings about sellers when it comes to being on Amazon? I know it sounds very like conspiracy theory. Let me put on my aluminum hat first. <laughs> They want to change the algorithm. And you might wonder like, okay, what does this have to do with AI? I feel like they are, <sighs> maybe we should save this for after we, we hit stop because it, it gets political. Welcome to What The Tech, your gateway to business strategies and tech secrets shaping today's workplace. Help me welcome to the podcast, Adriana Rangel. <laughs> Hi, Rolando. Hi, how I are you, Adriana? <laughs> Thank you. I'm, I'm so happy to be here. I love speaking, of course, about this topic, but also with uh, someone, you know, with your background and that it's also uh, in the e-commerce world. I, I feel like we're colleagues in a way, even though we don't work <laughs> alongside <laughs> we, we, each other. But we are. We, we are. <laughs> we're kindred spirits. You, we're both. We yeah. both have a podcast. Mm -hmm. We both use Helium 10. Uh, I do. Mm -hmm. uh, our organization yeah. does. And we both are in the e-commerce space, which is ever evolving, you know, and it's always a, a it's never a dull moment, right? Day to day, especially if you're on Amazon, specifically on Amazon, which is so fast at changing things from one month to another, or even a week to week, things evolve <laughs> yes. so fast. Yes. I mean, they keep us uh, on our toes, uh, definitely. Right. And, and as you said, the podcast space, it, it's so interesting, right? Like who would have known that we could be able to reach uh, thousands of people all over the world, right? Like all I know over, there are all Spanish, over, all over, yeah, yeah, Spanish speakers all over the world. And of course, English uh, speakers all over the world. Uh, mm -hmm. As you said, there are so many with these global opportunities that we have, there are so many, of course, opportunities, but also we know we have to know how to basically navigate this this uh, this path, right? When it comes to e-commerce, sure, we have you know a lot of people that can help us with logistics, with uh, import export, and all of that, but we ha mm -hmm. have to know how to approach it in the correct way. You know, I, I was just talking to on my last podcast to Jason Friedman. So big up, big props. Let me give a big props. Jason Friedman for coming on the podcast. Thank you very much. Letting us know how to be a better storyteller. You want to find out how to be a better storyteller? Check out that episode with Jason Friedman. But he was telling me that, you know, you, you have to understand the the kind of the journey, not just on, you know, clicking on Amazon, whether it's U.S. or Amazon Mexico. You understand where they're coming from before they get to the journey. And I would imagine this also applies if we're trying to market and trying to sell our goods and service into Mexico with folks in those markets, it's different than just, you know, translation in Google, you know, give me the Spanish version of what I have in English. Correct. Yes. I mean, our purchasing behavior is very different uh, from people in the U.S. As you mentioned in the introduction, which I thought was just like every time I hear that that statistic, it just blows my mind to hear how many people, how many Spanish speakers live and reside in the U.S. So, of Me course, too. I mean, it's two different, uh, two different uh, avatar, I, I would say, um, mm -hmm. basically like buyer personas that we can approach, but we should definitely approach uh, it differently, right? Because mm -hmm. people that live in the U.S., I mean, of course, they have different lifestyles, even though they carry, you know, the culture with them. And so I, I guess in my opinion, we, there are two big, very big opportunities, right? There's the opportunity of catering and offering our products to the U S uh, to, to the Spanish speakers in the U S because it's a mm -hmm. huge, huge population. And in there, 
I would say the pros of, of doing that, maybe even first as a first step to basically in, in your plan to approach the Spanish speaking audience would be that, of course, you know, you don't have to think about uh, borders. You don't have to think about export import. You don't have to think about all of that. Uh, you can still reach a very, very big population of people in the U.S. as long as you, of course, know how to uh, locate these, you know, the Spanish keywords. You know, when, when we talk about e-commerce, mm -hmm. we talk a lot about keywords, right? That's how we know how people are searching for our products in, in, in on Amazon or in any other search engine uh, platform that, that there is out there, basically. And so if we know how people are looking, people in the U.S. are looking, of course, in Spanish for our products, we can very easily just create a listing, of course, uh, basically um, where we offer our product and, you know, like uh, fill, fill it up with the Spanish keywords. So it shows in in the show, in the um, search results. Right. And, and you so know what? Something mm -hmm. that you say keywords, I just jump in here with you on that. Something mm -hmm. somebody pointed out to me that has that we're also using as a tactic is if you're using ChatGPT, they could give you a translation. But if you're using ChatGPT for Spanish language translation in the U.S., what you want to tell it, because the dominant, the, the just numbers there's more Mexican Americans in mm. the U S than any of the other countries. Right. So if you're going to try to hit the biggest market, you want to tell it, give me a translation that is Mexican American language spoken in the oh, U S right. Huh. Instead of just literal translations, now you're going to get a more linguistic feel for what's written in the voice of somebody that's from the U.S. that's Mexican-American versus, you know, usually it gets translated to the Spain Spanish, right? Yes. Uh, when you're, you're just doing <laughs> straight up translations. Yes. This will give you, and I would imagine uh, the Spanish spoken in Mexico for native speakers would be the prompt if you're trying to translate for folks inside of Mexico. That is such a great tip, Rolando, because... Of course, I mean, there's people from Colombia in the U.S., right? There, mm -hmm. There's people, as you mentioned, from Spain, from uh, Dominican Republic, you know, like many, many countries, Chile, et cetera, right? And we speak very, I mean, we speak differently, right? Of, as you said, it's very different. I mean, even though we can, of course, read uh, the Spanish, you know, from Spain, there are actually some, you know, there's like a Catalan, which is another... Uh, very different. I, I don't know if I should call it like a completely different language, but it's well, basically it like a, from... Yeah, you know, like a dialect of sorts. Yes. It's a kind of a dialect yes. of Spanish. Exactly. It's a version and, of it. Yes. And that one is so different from, the, you know, the Spanish that we are used to, even from the Sp uh, Spain Spanish, right? Uh, I remember yes. in college, uh, I had some, yeah, some, some people in, in, in my class, they were, uh, they were from, from Spain. They were from Barcelona specifically. And I, from what I've heard people in Barcelona, a lot of them speak, uh, speak Catalan. And so completely different. And also because you want to, because we do notice that, right? Like, just like, uh, you guys in the U S notice when someone that is not a native Spanish speaker is writing the emails or is writing the, you know, the listing or whatever, or, or the marketing, the branding and all of that, right? Like the text, you can, you can tell, you can pick it up and we don't want them to get distracted by that, right? By them being like, oh yeah, you know, this is another, just like another seller from elsewhere, right? Like from overseas or whatever. They, they do notice that. And so we notice that too, right? When we see instructions that it, that you can clearly tell that they didn't, you know, tailor it for us. How do you feel? Us, How do you feel? I'm going to tap my guest that was on the get on my, on my show earlier. Yes. What's the feeling that you get when you read those instructions and they're in Spanish spoken in Spain versus Mexican Spanish? Well, we feel like, um, I, I feel like we, I mean, our, our first instinct instinct is to, uh, support more of like local businesses, right? Just like mm -hmm. people in the U S. And so when we feel like when we notice that in, in, you know, in the translations from other products, we're like, Oh, you know, like this, you know, it's like the others, right? Like, you know, people from outside. A little you can bit. put like, it to like, a bucket, the outsiders. <laughs> exactly. I mean, even, I mean, I don't feel like we even notice it. You know, it's like, just like a split se uh, second, I guess, judgment or, or, you know, like how we, uh, you know, perceive things. I, I, I guess sometimes we don't even notice that it's happening in the back but of you our know, minds. In the Mexican market, I, I got to tell you, I've, I've traveled from Mexico to Chile. Um, it's the mm. closest of, obviously we share a border, but it's the closest in, in, in the, in the, um, thought process to the Americans. than if you go to Colombia, if you go to Chile, mm -hmm. you go to Argentina, yes. it's, it's yes. not at all, like completely not even a drop, right? Mexico <laughs> yes. 
has because we're so close and there's a lot of going back and forth. There's yes. more of that American fabric, I would say, into yes. the the culture, but it's still distinctly Mexicano. Yes, yes. Um, even I'm I'm from Monterrey, which is a city that is northeast uh, in the country, and so we're only like maybe like a two hour drive from the border to the U.S. to Texas, basically, mm -hmm. and. And you can tell, like even uh, coming to Monterrey to visit, you know, you can tell how there's a lot of influence from the U.S. here, as opposed to if you go to Mexico City or to Chiapas or someplace else, you know, like yes. in the south of the country. And so, which is, I, I would, I, I would um, argue that it's a great thing actually for uh, people that are trying to sell in in this market because we're so we have many of the same, I would say, habits, um, many of the same ways we, you know, we purchase things. A lot of people here in Monterrey, we have, you know, we have uh, technology, of course, we have e-commerce, we have, we're used to that, we have Netflix, we, we even, you know, like the shows that we watch, HBO, Netflix, and all of that, right? Like we yes. watch the same shows. Uh, and sometimes we watch them in English even. Um, a lot of people from here, from the north of Mexico, Many of us, we studied uh, abroad. So either we went to, we studied in Canada or in the U.S. And so, you know, it's, uh, we have a lot of similarities then there. And, and we work together too, a lot. A lot of big mm -hmm. companies have set up shop in Monterrey and parts around, not far mm -hmm. from Monterrey, uh, because yes. of the proximity of the border, as well as the labor pool, like you're talking about, is a high, highly educated workforce as well in Monterrey. And the vibe, really, I've, I've been to Monterrey. Mm -hmm. The vibe oh. is different. And I'll also yes. say the food is different than in the <laughs> DF. People, those Chilangos that are in, yes. the, in Mexico City, uh, <laughs> they eat more or less the same thing. But, you know, they don't eat all of the same thing. So the food is yes. a little different, right? The, yes. the, the vibe yes. is just, just, it's a different feel in, in Monterrey versus the Mexico City or even Yucatan. Yes. And as you mentioned, we work together a lot. So we are used to, um, so the partnerships are there, right? Uh, and so it is fairly easy for someone in the U.S. to contact, uh, you know, let's say a, a shipping company or a, a import-export company here in, in Monterrey or in Mexico, um, and that they are, you know, like that they have a team that speaks English, first of all, right? And that Which they are- awesome. Mm -hmm, yeah, yeah. And, and that they know Exactly. You know, they do this every day, right? They, they import stuff from the U.S. and they export stuff to the U.S. And as you say, as, as you just mentioned, we, uh, I mean, there's a, uh, you know, one of the top universities is here in, in Monterrey. And so we are used to having, uh, you know, like we, we to move it up the, the career ladder when it comes to uh, management and all of that. So you would be dealing with uh, teams of people that are very, very qualified for, for the job. And I love that the, in Monterey, it's a, it's, it's a smaller city, you know, compared to Mexico city, which is mm -hmm. like, yes. you look, you could be on a mountain <laughs> on a house and it's just homes as far as the next mountain over the next one and over the next yes. one, as far as the eye can see, there's homes and buildings, right? Monterey has got yes. a smaller, more homey kind of feel. And I really love that about Monterey. And and one of the things I wanted to really ask you about as well as we're talking about Monterey, I know Mex uh, Amazon has set up shop in different parts of the, of the country. Yes. Is, is what's going on. I don't know if you saw I, this article that I saw recently that I wanted to share with you and jump into you, or if you could pull that up is that there's a lot of, and we're seeing this also in other markets in Europe where sellers on Amazon on the platform are starting to get, I don't want to say recognition, but their voices are getting noticed because Amazon exerts a lot of influence. Uh, Amazon mm. makes changes and sometimes it, it impacts sellers in a negative way. And a lot of the attention for years has been on the customer, right? In terms of mm -hmm. media attention and whatnot. But I saw this article and it caught my attention because it said that uh, the version of the U.S. FTC or what you guys have locally, mm -hmm. uh, a, a certain ministry of the government is looking yes. into Amazon and its impact on sellers when it makes decisions to like, let's say, suppress the buy box or some other mm -hmm. things. And they want Amazon to reveal how sellers are impacted. Huh. 
which in turn may end up having, they may end up having to reveal parts of the algorithm. At least that's what this article says, because wow. there's things that they do that really change up how sellers are able to be successful on the platform. Have you been hearing any from your end rumblings about sellers when it comes to being on Amazon? And, you know, it is a black box in some ways, right? We don't know all the levers. <laughs> and and I would mm -hmm. imagine in Mexico, there's more more momentum now towards looking at this mm -hmm. because the market is getting bigger. Amazon's getting more of a presence. More sellers are on the platform. So the voices are starting to bubble up. Yes. And also, you know, a, a couple of things uh, popped in mind as you were uh, mentioning this article. I think that, first of all, there used to be, and there is still there, I mean, it's still here, but I feel like, of course, uh, Amazon is, is, taken a lot of its market market share. Uh, this platform that's called Mercado Libre. I don't know mm -hmm. if you, if you yep, I've heard of Mercado Libre. Yep. Yeah. 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 And they, they were huge. I mean, they're, they're still pretty big, um, especially in, in the Southern part of uh, Latin America, but, or, 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 or of America actually. And, and I mean, they, I mean, Amazon, you know, you know how Amazon is. They are very aggressive when it comes to penetrating market. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like, of course, Mercado Libre, it's a company. I think it's an Argentinian company. I'm, That's I'm not about, sure I think so. Not. Some one of those yeah. southern southern hemisphere companies for sure. Yes. Maybe yes. Uruguay. And I don't so, know why Uruguay is floating around in my head. Somewhere in there. Maybe. Yeah, yeah. I, I know it's somewhere. Uh, I know it's not Mexican. Uh, okay. So so one thing and uh, another thing that, uh, that I thought about as, um, as I'm thinking of the companies that are getting impacted by Amazon Amazon's presence here in Mexico is, for example, the big uh, media empires, really the big media companies, right? In here, we used to have like two main channels, like the, the channels that everyone used to watch in local TV that were like Televisa and TV Azteca. Mm -hmm. And these guys were, you know, of course, the, the founders and the owners and even the CEOs, uh, these guys used to run the town, right? Like they, they had all the <laughs> That's power. That's the way it goes, yes. baby. <laughs> That's true. Uh, actually, you know what um, just came to mind, you know, uh, this show, uh, Succession, uh, that basically yes. um, Love that mirrors show. a little bit, right? Mirrors yes, yes. The, uh, the, what happened in the Fox, uh, mm -hmm, I guess mm -hmm. the Fox empire, right? That's and right. it's very similar here where these two media companies uh, were the ones that, you know, like the, the presidents and, and the government uh, or whoever was running for office, they wanted, you know, I mean, uh, how, yeah, I mean, they, they were, they had a lot of power and, you know, if you wanted to run for office or if you wanted to reach the, the you know, the, the people, you had to go through them just like as many, you know, like uh, similar to, to what happens in, in the American media companies as it well. It sounds a lot like and Telmex so, for a while too, with, with Slim oh, as well. I mean, you it's know? pretty much, yeah. I mean, it's, he's pretty much the. <laughs> he's a king yeah, maker the owner yes yes exactly and so what happened you know when when now that you mentioned slim and all that i mean they have a lot of yeah, a big presence in media right and and mm -hmm. then comes you know along comes uh amazon prime you know and so many of the actors and and people that were playing a part in, in this company and that had to deal with you know like very bad contracts basically um they you know, all of a sudden they can, uh, of course, you know, create their own show in uh, Amazon Prime or in Netflix, et cetera. And these guys are like, what? Like they, they start to lose the grip, right? On, on actors and on, on mm. basically on, 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 on the workforce. Wasn't the last Narcos filmed in, in, in Mexico as well? The last? There was one because I didn't. Um, so I didn't watch that show, but there there were a couple. And I remember there was this one that I, on Netflix uh, from this Mexican actress where she yeah, she got in, in, in trouble with the government, right? Because really? she was trying to, yeah, she was trying to grow in, in Hollywood. And so she was trying to connect with El Chapo, which is, of course. Oh, yes, I did. That's the, the, yes, yes, yes. And that's how, they, that's how they got him, right? They used her yes. to, to get to El Chapo. Can you, uh, can you imagine, like, you run an, such a successful organization, I mean, you know, uh, for so for decades, I, I would imagine. And then that's how they get you, you know, because <laughs> you're like, what? that's crazy. Like, oh, like, and, and I watched that show. And, and so, yeah, basically 
um, just like this actress, they are like, you know what? Like, I don't, I don't need to be playing your guys' games and, and you're under your rules, right? And so mm -hmm. I would, that is, that is what came to mind when uh, you, you brought up this article. It's like, of course, yes, a lot of, you know, the main players, they see, they, I would imagine they can start to get uh, preoccupied about how people are having more options. Right. It's, it's, and then, cra it's crazy to, it's crazy to think that, you know, in 2024, you know, or it, it, to some extent it's, is like, you know, the U S but you know, there's, there's a couple of more players. Right. But in, there, mm -hmm. there's not like 50 media companies. There's really a handful in the U S that mm -hmm. are really big and powerful, but in, in Mexico, it's really concentrated with the two. And now you have this yeah. little upstart. Um, and it's interesting that the, the prime, um, the prime media aspect is what's taking front and center and driving all of these uh, conversations at, at the government level. It's like, Hmm, wait a minute. And I can imagine I, I've been in Mexico and I've been in, in some of those kinds of conversations. <laughs> and you know, the the guys don't, don't, don't take very well when some, some new <laughs> upstart is going to upset the apple cart over there. Of course. Yes. I mean, it's, it's hard. I mean, I, I feel like, uh, the only, yeah, I guess the only company that could have actually make a, a dent and make a difference in how, you know, how people hear, you know, the options that we have. Yeah, it would be technology companies because at the end of the day, uh, Netflix is a technology company. Sure, they have their media uh, arm and all of that, but, it, but it's that basically, right? And so that is why I'm so excited um, to, to have, of course, that podcast, that podcast in Spanish and all the content we do in Spanish because many even when i graduated from college which was somewhere around like 10 years ago or so it was you know i mean even your parents tell you that right like it's you know go and look uh, and apply for a job at these you know four companies which are like the main companies at, at least here in monterrey and and good luck right like i mean just like work your your way up the ladder and if you have to do if you have to work 10 or 12 hour days sometimes Sometimes, basically, uh, you just have to put up with it, right? And I, I mean, I, I'm sure you heard. I guess productivity is a, a different factor, but I there are some, uh, I guess, uh, publications that mention that the average, you know, like the time of, I guess, the the amount of hours that a that the average Mexican works is like the high or one of the of the highest uh, in in the world, like the time we spend at the office, right? Of course, you you could argue, okay, when it comes to productivity, like you know, like that's a, a, another factor. To take into <laughs> it's account. a different story, but I agree <laughs> exactly. with you. Let me let me. I could tell you of, of of the very many times that I've been in Mexico, I have been in meetings that have gone mm -hmm. all the way to like eleven p.m. Um, it's not like. Hey, I'm a government worker and I'm checking out at 5 p.m. See ya. Boop, yeah. Done. No right? way. Mm -hmm. No yeah. way. No, that's, that's actually, yeah, like disrespectful in a way, right? And then um, many people, they are still, I don't know, if, I, I'm, I hope they're, they don't think this way anymore, but many people are like, I cannot leave before the boss leaves. Like, I, he needs to see me here at 8 or 8.30 p.m., after he leaves, I'll, I'll make sure to leave. Right. Yeah. Because yeah. Oh yeah. I've, I've seen that when I've gone there and, and I'm, I tell him, Hey, oh yeah. La comida. <laughs> don't forget. <laughs> hey, I yes. want to go eat. I know you're trying yes. to make sure the boss sees, um, sees you. that we're being good workers here and we had to do all this yes. stuff, but you know, my yeah. mouth is getting hungry. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's ridiculous. That, that is why I guess, uh, early in my career, I was like, no, there has to be another way. And, um, to be, it's, it's not that I had this vision or whatever. Like I, I feel like I got lucky by learning about e-commerce. It's not that I, I knew I didn't want to do that, you know, to follow that career path for the rest of my life, because I was like, no, you know, as, especially as, as a, as a female, I don't want to make it a, a gender thing, but as a, but it, it does, I mean, it does kind of determines how your career is going to go, uh, in many a country such as. Well, let's, let's just be, let's just be real, real, real about it. You know, there is, um, 
There are differences in how the gender roles play out in the U.S. Oh, yeah. versus Mexico versus Colombia versus Argentina and España. There's just there's yeah. no there's no way to sugarcoat it. That it, it is exactly it, it. There are some differences in how that works in the professional environment. Um, it's not always great, but it, it's mm -hmm. good to acknowledge. And hopefully, uh, there's progress being made. Um, in that front because of opportunities like this that allow you to make your own money, set your own rules, yep. set your own time and, and, um, and, and, you know, determine your own path. And that's terrific that you realize that because not a lot of folks are bold enough to do that. And that's the other reason why I wanted to talk to you because, you know, I want you to give, tell us, tell us what, it, what is it like there selling products in Mexico, being on e-commerce, but, but then, you know, I've heard that businesses, like for, for example, I'm going to make it even smaller for FBA purposes. If you're, so if you're Amazon, you want to send stuff to the FBA. My understanding is that today you have to open up an entity in Mexico and that entity must have an employee that's in Mexico so that your FBA, and that's usually what's keeping a lot of the U.S. sellers at bay. So you're not really sending FBA products. You're just doing, you know, fulfilled by merchant into Mexico. Mm -hmm. Yes. So I hadn't heard about that, about about having a, a, an employee that kind of makes, I mean, it wouldn't surprise me if that were the case, especially with this, uh, with the president that, that is, you know, the Mexican president right now. Um, but I would say, okay, so so the opportunities that I see, and as you mentioned, we you can always uh, sell on Amazon, basically create a, a, a global listing, right? And mm -hmm. sell into, into Mexico. Um, but of course, you know, yeah, there, there, if you want to optimize for growing a brand in Mexico, then of course it would be better to have inventory in the, in the Mexican, uh, mm, warehouses okay. and fulfillment centers. Um, mm. but I would argue, of course, the, the size of the market it is much smaller, uh, compared to the U S but that, it's also because the U.S. is the biggest market in the world. Uh, Amazon U.S. is the biggest market in in the world, right? So it's it's hard to even like come close to the biggest market in the world. But in here, there's well, first of all, uh, a competition, right? Of course, as I mentioned, many people. Uh, of course, there are some entrepreneurs here, but many people do have to have uh, a full time job. I had a full time job when I started this, and I eventually was able to leave it because I eventually my my business grew. Um, in a way awesome. that it just didn't make sense to, to keep the job. Mm -hmm. But um, there's many people, like I even think about my, you know, my circle of friends, right? That, that they are people that went to, uh, to to college and even studied abroad and all of that. And many of them, they haven't made the leap. They, they keep their nine to five, which is not a nine to five, as we mentioned, but yeah. they keep their full time job and, and they don't take, uh, basically they don't hop into uh, this opportunity. And so, I would uh, argue that there's a, a big, big, big uh, market share that you can that you can get for your business if you um, if you launch your yeah your brand here in Amazon Mexico. Also, as you know, as an Amazon seller, you you know this very well that the PPC costs, right? Basically, like Amazon advertising or like a pay per click. Even even if you think about Google, um, Google ads, right. Or Facebook ads, et cetera. The cost of the click here in Mexico is, I mean, uh, of course I, I don't want to say an exact, uh, percentage of how less expensive it is here in Mexico, but it's basically, I would, I mean, it wouldn't surprise me if it's somewhere around 70%, uh, you know, lower or less. Seven, expensive. You said seven, 70, seven, zero. I would, uh, maybe, maybe 65 or seven, zero percent. Uh, yeah. Uh, seventy percent less expensive. Uh, Ooh, so in the, so in, in so Mexico. you could get your word the word on the street, and get your message out a lot cheaper. Um, yes. versus in the U.S. Yes, and not all, not only. I mean that that is not limited to Amazon ads, right? As I said, Google ads, uh, Facebook ads, um, and. Because there's, there are not many, you know, there are a lot of uh, mom and pop shops here in Mexico, right? And they yep. are not doing Google ads. They are not doing Facebook <laughs> ads. It's just like word of mouth, right? And there are some, men, there are some agencies here in Mexico that they, they can help you with that. Of course, if, if you want to um, work with people in Mexico, even, I mean, that would be a great excuse to have your 
your first employee, right? In, in Mexico, mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to, to, <laughs> when it comes to setting, setting shop here in Mexico and getting your like tax ID and all that, of course, I mean, that's, I mean, that's a, a process that you have to take care of. Um, I myself had to set up an LLC in the U S and I had to, uh, cause I'm not, I'm not a U S citizen, citizen or, or anything like that. And so I had to, I was like, okay, so how do we do this? And then, uh, which state do I choose? Like what state and federal <laughs> so tax? Like states, what is yes. that? Yeah. Like in here, we only have, you know, this is the tax, uh, percentage that, that, that you pay and that's it regardless of where you live. Um, yeah. and so, but you know, it's, it's a process. And if you work with someone that is an expert in that, that there are many agencies and people here that you can connect through, even through LinkedIn or, or, you know, like sometimes you can reach out to these people, you know, you can find them in, in a day and they can help you out with that. And it doesn't have to be, I, I wouldn't, I mean, for me, of course it, it was uh, free as a Mexican, right. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't think that it's a very expensive process for people, for, for foreigners. Right. And of course it takes maybe a couple of months. Um, but after that, once you get ov over that hurdle, basically, I would argue that it's, I mean, you can apply what you know of selling uh, on Amazon US and can very easily make it here in Amazon Mexico because it's much, much less competitive, much, much mm. less competitive, less expensive. Mm -hmm. I mean, you just have to basically as a, as an entrepreneur, you know, this Rolando, uh, you just have to choose who you are who you're going to work with, right? Who mm -hmm. are going to be your partners. And of course, you know, maybe you're not getting, going to get it right the first time, but, uh, once and that you takes do, a while. I, mean, I tell you what, that, um, you know, today's world and the Amazon world wasn't there when, um, uh, one, when I was traveling more heavily there, this is going back a while now. Uh, but mm. you know, and it, you, you really, you know, from the, if you're a manufacturer or a brand, um, the D to C play wasn't there like it, it is today or even mm -hmm. Amazon is today. And you really picked on, re uh, you selected resellers or local agents. Um, and, mm -hmm. and that's one way to get in the, in the door without having to make a, um, an investment, let's say an employee and registering the company. Mm -hmm. And it would be another tool for a uh, businesses to look at to see, is there a, a way to get into that market? without making that investment in, in, let's say somebody that's a direct employee and having to worry about taxes. Yes. And I mean, also one thing that we also, uh, you know, people in Mexico, we have in the back of our minds is that of course there is a, a treaty, right? Uh, mm -hmm. A treaty with the U S and after treaty. And so I, myself, I, I, of course, more, most of my income or actually all of my income from comes from the U S. And so there's that treaty that, of course, you know, if you pay taxes in the U.S., then, of course, in here, uh, they, they take it easier on you, right? Because you're right, already right. paying taxes in the U.S. And I would imagine that is the same uh, case with uh, people in the U.S. when they're trying to make business here in Mexico. Um, there are also a lot of, in here, as I mentioned earlier, there's, uh, you know, one of the biggest and the most, I guess, prestigious universities is here in Monterrey. And... They have, you know, their business school and their graduate school and, and, and all of that. And they have offices uh, filled with people that can, that, you know, their job is basically to help entrepreneurs launch their business in, uh, launch their business in general. Right. And so right. they would be a great, uh, just like a, as a tip, maybe that they would be a great team of people or, or, or even just one person to, to reach out to and be like, Hey, you know, like I hear you know, you, we need to get a, you know, a, a set shop in Mexico, et cetera. Like how would I go around that? Right. And, mm -hmm. and I mean, that's their job and, and they, I feel like it's a nice way to, um, yeah, to, to get your foot in the door. And also, I mean, many of them, they're like, yeah, sure. Like I'll help you, but do you mind? I mean, if you're an expert in, in marketing or in e-commerce and ranking in Amazon and all of that, would you mind coming to Monterrey someday and giving a talk to our graduate students? It's like, sure. You know, like, and, and that's how you get, uh, you know, how, how you get started. And they are the ones that, I mean, they are connected. I'm as I would imagine, I feel like that's the, the first, uh, the first step that I would take, um, connecting with, uh, with these guys over here because they are connected to, you know, the CEOs of, of the 
main companies here in Mexico. So they they always have someone that they can refer you to. Um, right. And I find that and I find that also very refreshing when you work in and around uh, countries in Latin America is that um, the organizations tend to be more flat as opposed to mm. here. There's a lot mm -hmm. more layers and to get to the sometimes the decision maker takes a lot more, you know, to get to huh. the top. And because mm. organizations are flatter, you can get to the decision maker much more quickly. And because the way, the, you know, us Latinos are, we're a little more social. So, yes, I know. Yes. <laughs> I know Slim. Right. You want to have a meeting yes. with Slim? OK, he's my uncle. <laughs> <laughs> you want to you want to meet with uh, Abridor? Uh, you, you know, he's my uncle. You know, let's 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 go. Hot, let's go. Let's go to lunch and then we'll talk about it and I'll bring it to him. Right. That, that yeah, that's the kind of way the, it, that I, that was been my experience on my, on my trips uh, yes. with 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 different people and it's and it's really terrific. It's not like here and that part is very refreshing. But you know, you mentioned yes. something about about setting up shop and you remind mm -hmm. me of something that I was thinking about when it comes to what's happening in China and mm -hmm. businesses moving now into Mexico as well as other companies in the U.S. trying to bring their offshore stuff into Mexico because of all mm -hmm. the problems that happened throughout the pandemic, the shipping, yes. the logistics, everything, the politics of what's happening over there. What's that been like? And we've got an article, or he's got it here, why Chinese companies are flocking to Mexico. And I believe that's from the, is that from The Economist, Ori, that we've got up on the screen? So, mm -hmm. uh, so from The Economist. And so nearshoring, that's the term that's being used, nearshoring, and why Chinese companies are flocking to Mexico. I wanted to ask you about that. You know, I'm sure you're hearing about these big companies. Some are big, mm -hmm. some are small, and they want to be in Mexico because, you know, two hours from Monterey, you're hitting Texas yeah. and the U.S. market. Yeah. What's going on right now with Mexico and, and this nearshoring? Yes, as you mentioned, uh, yeah, well, the term nearshoring, yeah, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's gotten very popular now, right? Uh, because as you said, you know, the convenience of, of, you know, if you have a problem for, for some reason, right? Like you wake up to, to some sort of uh, text or message that, you know, whatever happens uh, in, 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 in Mexico, right? Uh, mm -hmm. You can get to Mexico, even if you don't live in, in Texas. I mean, we have connecting flights uh, and, and you could very easily get to Mexico by noon, right? And even go oh, back yeah. home at night, right? As opposed mm -hmm. to, I mean, making a trip to China. Uh, we just recently here in Monterrey, there, there's been a lot of noise, which is not a, a, a Chinese company, but Tesla, you know, mm -hmm. such a big company. They just yeah. set up shop here in Monterrey. It's just like a town very close to, to Monterrey. It's not, I think it's, yeah, I think it's uh, just like a 30 minute drive from where I am at, in this moment. And it's, a huge, you know how how uh, Elon Very Musk big. does it, right? When, yeah, yeah. I mean, this. Uh, uh, and super... what are they building there? They can do the trucks, or they can do the cars, or the, the, the batteries. What are they doing down there? I'm pretty sure it's uh, cars. That, I think I'm pretty sure they're assembling cars. Wow. Uh, I, I mean, I haven't been there, but I know that they are hiring a lot. Not not only for you know, like uh, for people that do the the, the assembly, but also for managers. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. um, that, that is why, or, or at least rumor has it, um, that that is why they opened a uh, direct flight, Austin, uh, Monterrey. Mm, makes sense. <laughs> it makes sense. Yes. You know, I took a flight from Houston. This was a couple of years uh, ago. It was like mm -hmm. literally the first flight at 6 a.m. And I'm thinking, hey, I've taken morning flights. There's going to be yeah. half full or a few people. It was mm. completely packed going into Monterey at 6 a.m. The whole, like there was no room. No room, and they yes. were looking for stand, uh, for people that wanted to volunteer their seat. I could not, but it, everybody had their own little backpack, <laughs> their wheel. And I'm like, yes. it's all business. It's all business people. And I can, you know, yeah, with Tesla opening up there, 100%, it's, you know, the influence of people that are going to be going back and forth. Yes. And I mean, let's remember, maybe uh, this happened, I would I would, I'm, I'm going to say maybe two or three years ago. Uh, no, no, actually a little bit more when the uh, previous organization was, um, uh, yeah, basically was in, in, in the U.S., the previous government organization, and uh, that they imposed the Chinese or the China tariff, remember? Yep, uh, this was yep. like right before, the, yes. The, yep, maybe the right China tariffs. The yeah, I remember that. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. And, and that was like a, a, a big one, right? Because it was... Um, 
so many products. It was, it was a lot of products. A lot of products. <laughs> yes. You were the very few that were exempt from that. Uh, more recently, they've rescinded that and they've pulled those 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 tariffs. There's some that are still yeah. in place, but a lot of them are gone. Yes. And that's like a double digit tariff, right? Like it's not like 5%. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Oh, that yes. of course impacts your, your cost of goods sold, right? And in here, uh, as I mentioned a few moments ago, we have NAFTA. We have that mm-hmm. treaty that, yes, if you set up shop or if uh, manufacturing companies set up shop here, even, and I know of a couple of people that they, they do have their, it's more of a, uh, like a, an assembly, you know, they mostly buy uh, a lot of, you know, material and, and yeah, and products from China and then yep. they assembly them here and mm-hmm. then they, uh, they export it to, to the U S and of course, if you, if you know, it, it, there's a rule of, over there that, um, you cannot, I, I mean, I, I would say the, uh, what, what is the name of the, uh, I'm not expert in manufacturing, but basically if it's, you know, if less than like 50% of, the product. It, I believe it's, it's you have to China. be 51% uh, made in uh, the like Canada, yeah. US or Mexico. Uh, the, yes. net, the, the, the value of the product is, mm-hmm. is 51% of what you're putting in is from, you know, from around there, then you can yes. call it, you know, essentially for, you can use it for NAFTA purposes. Yes. And so, I mean, that, that is, I mean, we, I feel like uh, sometimes when we're starting a business, we don't think about all those details, but it does, impact the bottom line quite a bit, quite a bit. Um, if you have these treaties that will, you know, mm-hmm. enable you to have a, a lower cost of, uh, cost of goods, that's, that's very impactful. Um, I feel like the barrier to entry, at least the perceived, actually, that's the, 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 the better way to explain it, the perceived barrier to entry, uh, but by many people that, you know, that they think that, people setting up in Mexico have, um, I feel like that actually makes it so much easier for people that are like, okay, I mean, if I just need to connect with the right people and I'm, of course, I know that this, this is going to be a process and it's going to, uh, you know, take some, uh, take some money to, to fix, you know, in in the initial part of, of the process. But, uh, you know, that many people, I mean, we know that many people are like, no, why even bother? Like, no, no, no. You know, I'm, I, I've heard about there's a lot of corruption and I heard it's like, and, and sure, you know, that, you know, that, <laughs> that I mean, happens. Uh, yeah, that happens. But it in, also in all like of the it, Latino countries, by the way, and in other yes. countries outside of the of Latin America, too. There's, yes. There's and, corruption. But, I, but I feel yes. Yes. But I feel like that's the that's the, the thing. The one thing that gets the headlines all the time. Right. Well, and it's so, sensational, right? It's, it's, yes. it grabs your attention, you know, uh, yes. a, a, a big bin of money was found inside somebody's freezer or, or a, a big, freezer. huge, big, huge baggage full of cash was in somebody's yeah. trunk, right? That is going to make the headlines every time, yes. no matter what country you're in. Yes. Yes. And so I feel like many people get, uh, disencouraged by, by, the, by, by reading that, but then the few that don't, they do. It's just like, you know, it happens to us Amazon sellers all the time when we hear about, oh, you know, the new, uh, you know, the new FBA fee or the new low uh, inventory fee that, yes, you know, that that's Amazon. The new one. It, yes, in 2024 and all that. And it's like, sure, I mean, that's not great news, right? But then. What are that, you hearing about that on your, on your side of the, on your side of the border? What are you hearing? <laughs> What's the rumblings from from people, you know, over there. I mean, I've just was talking to somebody today about this and he was telling me his perspective. What are you hearing from over there? I feel like they are, I feel like they are trying to get rid of many sellers that are yeah. uh, treating this as a, as a hustle, right. Or like an extra mm. income t- kind of thing. I feel right. like they, they want to focus on, on brand. And in order to do so, they, I feel like they have to up the ante a little bit. And I mean, for the ones that we are, that we are willing to just like uh, figure it out in in some way or in a way or or another, I feel like it's going to be, I mean, it's, it's great in a way, right? Because we always whine about, you know, you know, this, uh, you know, the Chinese sellers and all of that and, and people that are, are just trying to hijack your listing and all of that. I feel like it, it will get, it, it if will you really get want me to have people. a drink, 
you talk, <laughs> say just the word hijacker, and I'm <laughs> I'm running out the door to get a drink. That yeah. alone. Yes, yeah, exactly. And so I feel like even if that, um, I feel like, you know, people will very quickly find other like get rich uh, fast uh, schemes or crypto or whatever the case, and they'll just uh, go there, hopefully, right? And so I feel like Amazon is trying to 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 keep the sellers that are going to grow with with them. And mm-hmm. also I feel I, I've heard, or, or you, because you asked me about the rumblings, right? I've heard mm-hmm. that Amazon is trying to adapt to the to everything that's happening and that will continue to happen when it comes to AI. So, mm-hmm. and, and you might wonder like, okay, what does this, this ha- have to do with AI? So what I'm hearing is that main, they want to um, basically change the algorithm. I know it sounds very like, <laughs> I don't know. Well, I, well, I, I like, think that because that article where we were talking about gets yeah. to a little bit of the exposing the algorithm and which is kind mm-hmm. of the conversation we were having earlier. We're at an, I think we're at an inflection point now where yes. AI mm-hmm. is changing the game. It mm-hmm. will change even more. There's stuff happening and evolving so rapidly that are, have nothing to do with text to video, which is the newest thing as of today, mm-hmm. but have everything to do with how Amazon shows you what product you you may be interested mm-hmm. versus today where, you know, I just put in, you know, I want red toothpaste and it mm-hmm. serves me some searches based on what other people searched in the past. It's going to try to deliver something more tailored to me, theoretically, mm-hmm. because it, it yeah. knows me, it has information, it has history. And so the AI will serve up those results, which could be a good thing. And depending on where you are, could be a bad thing. Yes. And apparently, I mean, to your point about it will serve you um, the products that they think that you are most likely to to choose and all of that. Apparently, location of your inventory will play a, a very big factor. Um, ooh, ooh, to, ooh to, talk to about that. that. You know, talk about because that that is to, because <laughs> look the biggest expense theories. that we have as a business, and I'm sure you yes. and a lot of Amazon sellers, the biggest expense. If you're looking at your monthly, oh my God, this inventory is expensive. It's eating up oh a lot God, of my yes. cash my flow. cash flow, right? Mm-hmm. How does having your product in you know New York and in Miami and in LA have anything to do with how people find the product on Amazon? I think that Amazon has a big motivation um, to have your inventory in as many locations, I mean, as close as possible to your clients. Mm-hmm. Um, because of course, you know, that's a, a very, uh, better, uh, customer experience and all of that. And it also costs them less. Right. So yes. I feel like if they can optimize their, uh, logistics around, around, uh, logistics uh, around location, I'm sorry. I feel like, um, and of course, if you help them by having more inventory on, on hand, right. As opposed to having the, you know, exa- just what, what you need basically, right. To have mm-hmm. in, 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 in yeah, in their warehouses or in their fulfillment centers, then basically you help them uh, to optimize their logistics to get to their to the customer faster. Because I, I'm sure it has happened to you where you get multiple packages a week sometimes <laughs> if you're shopping a lot, right? Yeah, and Monday it's like I them, got the toothpaste, Tuesday the toilet paper, <laughs> and in Wednesday a box, right? was like, the, <laughs> my my plant potting soil mix that came in on Wednesday, and then it all like <laughs> should have just arrived in one box. Exactly. And so if you help them, even if in, in a small way, uh, you know, to make less trips, to make less flights, you know, how they have their their, this, uh, their own airline, right? Like cargo mm-hmm. airline, mm-hmm. but their own airline. If you help them at that, I mean, that would, I mean, that, that, that would, would make a dent in their, in their, in oh, the they'll have more way, margin. Of so, yes. and, and what, what, what I don't, uh, we don't know yet, because this is going to start here in April, we're, we're taping this before that is it'd be nice if there was some incentive, you know, so, you know, they have like, sometimes if you do this, you know, we'll lower the referral fee. If you mm-hmm. do that, we'll let you put new products into FBA with a zero. Over the, so mm-hmm. where I, I would love to see at some point where those sellers that are inside of the metrics they want, they're mm-hmm. rewarded somehow because they are lowering their bottom line. We don't know if that's going to happen. Amazon, if you're listening and I know, <laughs> 
you got some folks listening to our podcast as I've seen the metrics and analytics. Oh, okay. Yes. Do something for do something for those sellers that are also helping you save money and increasing your bottom line by helping those sellers in return with some type of incentive mm-hmm. to make sure that the inventory mix is optimal. So that's just my yes. two cents on that. And and the conspiracy theory, because of course, there's no way to. <laughs> oh, to, the conspiracy. To prove it, Let right? me put on my aluminum hat first. So, <laughs> I love conspiracy theories. By the way, I oh love yeah, them. what's the I, I what's the one that you've heard? I would love to hear. Let's get into that. Oh, one. What's the yeah. conspiracy theory? So this is a disclaimer. <laughs> conspiracy theory. We don't know. We're not sure. But this is what's on the street. I mean, uh, maybe we should save this for for after we we oh, hit the- stuff because it, it gets political. So oh <laughs> and I know, my goodness, yeah, we'll I mean, save it. We'll save it. We'll save it for the um for the Instagram live or something like that, where it's a small audience. Okay, <laughs> let's do it. Uh, yeah, no, but I feel like uh, yeah, I you know, I guess that's where that conspiracy theory comes in, right? That they you know that the algorithm will will also take into account. Um, the fact that you have available inventory in many different locations. And if, because they don't, of course, they never want to give the customer the, um, I guess the bad experience of, you know, going into the, uh, the listing and they, you know, it's out, out of, uh, out of stock or running out yep. of stock or only has yep. three units set up or whatever the case. And so that is why I feel that they are pushing for, for sellers to have more inventory at hand and and I do feel like I don't know if this has happened to you, Rolando, but I feel like as when I'm close to because I I have run out of stock uh, a couple mm-hmm. times. I hate it when that happens, but it, but you know it, it happens sometimes. And I I do feel like it impacts my my ranking, the ranking of that. Well, product. no, it's a hundred. You're not. It's not a conspiracy theory because uh, folks in in the Facebook group group that I belong to of of sellers, um, and mm-hmm. I've heard this also from other sellers that are pretty big that have really kind of you know, dive into this a little bit more there. You get some um, juice. I'll call it juice. Mm -hmm. If your inventory, let's say New York city and you have inventory Mm -hmm. in New York city and you type in red toothpaste, just using that and your inventory is there, you're going to, your results are going to get surfaced first before somebody that has it in California all the way on the other Mm -hmm. side. And so although the seller may be bigger or better or whatever, they want that. I don't know the exact nature, mm-hmm. you know, whether it moves it up to number one position versus at the bottom of page. But I've heard other sellers that have been, you know, looking into this, the exact same conspiracy theory. Yes. Yes. So, I mean, there, I mean, there are several, I guess, hypothesis, uh, hypotheses, right? That point back to having inventory in, uh, I guess, in as many uh, yes. warehouse or fulfillment centers as possible. Mm-hmm. So it, it comes out no, no, no surprise when they're like, oh, yeah, I mean, if you if you have very little inventory, you know, you'll have to pay the fee because, I mean, it makes sense. Now we have to fly your stuff from California to, <laughs> to New York. Yes. It can be, you know, uh, it can be very, very costly. So I think um, I think, I mean, if we just get very smart about how we manage our cash flow and and yeah, and just like keep uh, dry powder, right? Like keep our cash there uh, just uh, in case we need more inventory. That's what I'm, that's, that's what I'm, I've been doing in the past f- uh, few months, couple of months. I'm like, even though that cash, I'm, I might want to launch another product. I'm like, mm, maybe I'll just keep this cash at hand in case. Yeah. I need to yeah. More inventory. That's the rumblings I'm hearing from other rumbling. sellers as well. Like, mm-hmm. you know, this, this is going to require prioritization and another a seller I was yes. talking to today, he told me he's just, he's dropping certain products because the profit margin is lower and mm-hmm. he's going to go stick with the ones that are producing more margin. So yeah. I don't know how this is all going to shake out, but if, if this is really enforced and st- sellers start seeing this, you know, hit them hard, I just think some products are just going to shrink. Like the availability is going to shrink. There may be some more out of stocks. And then like there may be some brands that are just not available at all. I mean, that's the mm-hmm. potential is there for having. It's not, not everybody has a big pocketbook with stacks mm-hmm. of cash. It's just, oh, we need another trailer load. God, don't worry. Take, take it out of the treasure chest and go ahead and buy another round. Of the freezer. <laughs> <laughs> out of the free, take it out of the freezer. Take it out of the freezer, buy another cold, trailer load and sell cash. it into to Amazon. Uh, no, cash is king for yeah. sure. Uh, well, yes. Adrian, I could talk to you, you know, for like 
another two hours because there's there's so much to talk about the near shoring and the conspiracy theories. And maybe that's what we leave (laughs) off for the next time. We'll start off the next the next round you and I get together. We'll 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 start Mm -hmm. off with the conspiracy theories because there's a lot. You know, if you're an Amazon seller, you know, you hear the conspiracy theories. (laughs) <laughs> yes, I mean, um, I, I would love to to mention, I feel like, I mean, we're in such a, as I said, like, I feel like I got lucky learning about this, uh, this business opportunity. And, you know, to, to the listeners that are learning, perhaps if this is the, the first, uh, the, the first time they, they hear about this opportunity, I feel like, I mean, it's just a matter of putting your head down for, you know, the next few months uh, and studying, you know, studying hard and all of that. And I feel like you can make it happen. Even if mm-hmm. one market doesn't work for you, there are like, I think like over 25 markets. Yeah. Um, and as, as long as you know how to identify who, you know, uh, what, which person you want to work with or, or team of, of people, I, I feel like you can make it happen. And I mean, and it's like the most I feel like it's the business, the business model that you can start with the less cash. Um, I mean, I, I, at least compared to, to other businesses, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. No, I guess you could start slow and, and ramp up and ramp up mm-hmm. fast. So as we <laughs> close, I want to do something really fast with you that we call rapid fire. Ori, can you give us the intro to the rapid fire segment? All right, Adriana, you've been such an awesome sport. Just tell me what hits your brain when I tell you these phrases. Whatever it is, it's your answer. There's no right or wrong. All right, here we go. Number one, let's start off with Walmart versus Amazon. Amazon. I mean, um, market share, market mm-hmm. share. That's, that's what right. I'm going to say. All right. Mm-hmm. Favorite social media platform youtube mm, interesting favorite piece of tech oh my god uh i'm gonna say anything that is um oh my god that's a, that's a good one uh, i'm gonna say anything that is uh video calls or anything that can connect you with someone that's not in your uh, you know, in your country or in your, you know, All right. nearby. Oh, gotcha. First thing to reach for in the morning. I shouldn't do this, but my phone, of course, you know. <laughs> you wouldn't be alone. My supplier in China. He needs <laughs> you wouldn't be alone in that task. <laughs> All right. Now, you and I both do podcasts. I'm you don't have to say my podcast for this one, but whatever one that you like, I want you to say, what's your favorite podcast right now? My first million. That's the, who, who's the, who's, um, who's, uh, who's in that? I was about to ask you if you heard. Yeah. I mean, it's this, uh, two guys, uh, mm, my uh, first million. One of them is yes. Uh, Sam and, and Sean, and they are very good too. Uh, when it comes to just like, uh, business brainstorming and all of that. And and it's fun. And they share actually like actionable, you know, uh, tips. All right. So the last one, I'm going to do this one in Espanol. I'm going to channel. Okay. I'm going to channel a little bit of Andres Cantor. (laughs) Lugar más favorito en México. Uh, Mexico City. Es Ciudad de México. Ah, de gusta el DF. Ah, Okay. Uh, La comida, I mean. Yeah. yeah. Aquí hay comida muy rica, pero en como Ciudad de México, los tamales, los postres. Mm, 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 <laughs> if you're not on a diet. But you can be in a, on a break from the diet, right? Yes. Yeah, I guess. Oh, indeed. Indeed. Well, Adriana, we also have, uh, we want to let people know that you have a podcast yourself. You've got a YouTube channel. Ori, can we put that up here on the video side so folks that are <laughs> following along on the video can check that out as well? Go ahead, plug it. Tell us about it. How can people? Yes. What do you do there? Yes. So I started a YouTube channel about a year and a half ago or so, or at least post- posting uh, consistently. And it's basically just tutorials on how to sell on Amazon. But I do this uh, in Spanish uh, for all my Spanish speakers. Uh, I know there's a lot of people in the U.S. that speak Spanish and, and that they... Uh, 
I mean, they, they prefer to study and to learn about this mis- business in their native language. Uh, so it's tutorials. Yeah, it's tutorials and it's everything from finding a product, listing, you know, your uh, product listing, uh, shipping, all, all of that good stuff. Awesome. And this is not just for folks that want to do business in Mexico. This is, this is could apply for, okay, so Spanish speakers that want to do business here in the U.S. Yes, actually, most of the, uh, I, I actually focus on people that want to that live outside the U.S. and that they want to sell in the U.S. because oh. I feel like that's the, the great business uh, opportunity, that the great arbitrage in a way, right? To, yes. to make uh, U.S. dollars and spend in Mexican pesos. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> yes. Yes. If I could... Let's see. Uh, I tell you what, I love, like, I've been to Merida. Okay. Love mm-hmm. Merida. Nice. It's Caribbean. Yes. It's not what people think of Mexico. It's not Me- mm-hmm. the F. It's not Mexico City. It's not Monterrey. It's, it's more, Cari- it's like being on a Caribbean island of sorts. Down there, you get the yes. nice ocean breeze and I love it. The food, the yes. food in Merida, mm, I would say rivals the Mexico City. <laughs> Yes, and a lot of people uh, feel that way. A lot of people from the from elsewhere, uh, I guess, foreigners, uh, because a lot of people uh, moved to to have been moving to to Merida and Tulum and all of that, of course. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they do basically do that location arbitrage a little bit, where they mm, oh yes, they making yeah. dollars and living there. You know, it's <laughs> like a like a tenth of the cost <laughs> living here. In, in, uh, in, I live in Washington, D.C., so oh. it's a tenth of what it is here. And you can make that wage over there, take the dollars back into Mexico and live like a king. So, yes, or save your money and, you know, and retire. Or save your, money and build a, <laughs> it, save your money and build a palace in Mexico, which is the other. I know a lot of folks have come That's here to work and then, you know, they go back and they're like, I live yeah. like a king now. I've got my nice, beautiful <laughs> home back there. So, Adriana, yes. I want to thank you for coming because you are awesome i love this conversation we could have just like kept recording all day oh, long because yes. there's so many amazon things to talk about um we'll dive into the conspiracy theories the next time we, we get together <laughs> uh, there's so much happening on amazon and here in the u.s and in yeah. mexico and i'm so glad that you came on today and uh, gave so much value to our audience thank you so much rolando i i enjoy i mean this didn't feel like you know uh, like actually recording a podcast. It, it, it's like if I were uh, on Zoom with you, I really enjoy chatting with you and, and we have so much in common. And sometimes when we are running a business, uh, sometimes it feels lonely. You want to chat with other founders. Uh, yeah. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Uh, yeah. And if they're yes. in your space and they have similar backgrounds to you, then, the, you know, even better. So thank you so much, Rolando, for inviting me. And I hope some, someday you can come to my channel too. Now, oh, and just tell me when. Send me the okay. calendar link and I'm there. Perfect. Thank you okay. so much, Rolando. I love thank your podcast. Thank you, Adriana. Awesome. Thank you for joining us today. And if you have enjoyed this episode with Adriana, you'll want to check out some additional episodes that we have both on our YouTube channel or on circuitloops.com where you can learn more about Amazon. We've got some episodes with some great guests, including a former Amazon employee who was in the advertising department, had all huh. kinds of interesting nuggets. His name is Nick Gazar. Go check that episode out. Dave and me, or Dave and I, will join you. <laughs> Even though he's not here today, we'll join you in that episode. We'll see you next time.